I'm Justin Tapp and this is Market Equilibrium. This tutorial is brought to you in part by Ceteris Paribus, holding all other variables constant. Because one task of economists is to simplify a complex world, the Ceteris Paribus allows us to see changes one at a time. Economists also sometimes simplify by using models with straight lines instead of curved ones, which would require calculus, and by looking at markets one good at a time, as we'll do today. Let's imagine Joe is a freelance teacher. He makes a tutorial for Kelly, who buys it for $100. And Joe could otherwise be earning $80 with the same time, so he's happy, and he earns a producer surplus of $20 for making the tutorial. Producer surplus is the difference between what a producer receives for the good or service and what he was willing to sell it for. Now the tutorial was worth $120 to Kelly, and she only paid Joe $100 for it. So, Kelly earns consumer surplus of $20. Consumer surplus is the difference between the price paid for a good and what you were willing to pay for it. Notice how if Joe had negotiated a price of $119, he'd have a greater producer surplus, and Kelly would have a much smaller consumer surplus. But $100 is the price that maximizes the size of consumer and producer surplus together. So they get $20 surplus each. So both surpluses are as big as they can possibly be together, which it turns out is one definition of equilibrium. It's the price that maximizes the sizes of your consumer and producer surpluses. Notice how this voluntary market transaction created this surplus. That illustrates how trade creates value and makes both parties better off. Now suppose the government imposes a $50 tax on providing freelance services. That would be kind of rough, because Joe would earn $100 for making a tutorial, but he would have to pay the $50 tax, leaving him with $70. And that $70 benefit is less than what Joe could earn elsewhere, so Joe wouldn't make the tutorial. And what about if Kelly pays the tax instead? Does it make a difference? Well, she'd pay Joe 100 for the tutorial and then have to pay the $50 tax. But the $150 cost is greater than the $120 benefit she gained from the tutorial. So now Kelly won't hire Joe. So the tax caused a dead weight loss, meaning it prevented a market transaction from happening, and otherwise useful resources to sit idle. So consumer and producer surplus are both lost as the transaction never happens. This occurs frequently as the government intervenes in the economy in such ways. Sometimes the government sets minimums for wages and benefits, or maximums for price. Perhaps you'd be willing to work less than the mandated wage, or without some of the benefits that are required, and an employer would gladly hire you and not pay you those, but it's not allowed by law. Perhaps you'd be willing to pay a higher price for an apartment that's in a rent-controlled district, but that would also be illegal. Those are examples of loss surplus and deadweight loss. So let's look at producer surplus as it relates to supply and demand, and we're going to be using the example of a vacuum manufacturer. So a vacuum producer will produce a vacuum so long as he can sell it for more than the cost to make it. And the difference between that marginal cost of producing it and the marginal revenue from selling it is his producer surplus. So in other words, if a vacuum costs $20 to make, the producer will be happy to sell it for $40. He'd get $20 producer surplus from that transaction. Consumers, likewise, will purchase the vacuum so long as the marginal benefit is greater than the marginal cost, which is the price they would pay for the vacuum, providing they have the money to buy it. So the difference between the marginal benefit and the marginal cost, or the price, is consumer surplus. So if a shopper is willing to pay $40 for it and can get $20 and can get the vacuum at $20, he's happy. That bargain is his consumer surplus. So let's look at the market for a particular vacuum. Here you can see how many units consumers are willing to buy at given prices. And here's how many units are supplied at the given prices. You can see that at $50, producers are willing to make a lot of these vacuums but not very many consumers are willing to pay $50. So at that price, you'd have a huge surplus of vacuums just sitting there. The price needs to come down. Similarly, at $0, plenty of people would love a free vacuum, 
but producers can't supply any at that price. So there's a large shortage. So the price needs to go up so producers can make more money producing. Eventually the market will find the right price at which quantity demanded will exactly equal the quantity sold and they'll meet in the middle. $30 is that price right here. Hey, that's another good definition for equilibrium. It's the price at which quantity demanded is exactly equal to quantity supplied. So let's draw a supply and demand graph using our data. So I will have price on the y-axis and quantity on the x, which is how we do it in economics. Here's the demand curve, and if you've watched my videos, you should remember that the height of the demand curve measures the marginal benefit, the most a consumer is willing to pay for the first, second, one hundredth, five thousandth, and so on vacuum. Here's supply. Remember that the height of the supply curve measures marginal cost of producing each additional vacuum. Here they are drawn together. You can see there is a point at where they cross, and that's where supply equals demand, and that's equilibrium. Well, because of what the demand curves measure, equilibrium is also where marginal benefit is equal to marginal cost. That's another definition of equilibrium. Good to know. So here's our graph with the equilibrium price of $30 labeled P star, an equilibrium quantity of 3000 labeled Q star. Given this price, I can measure consumer surplus. The green shaded area represents all the consumers who were willing to pay up to $60 for the vacuum, but, but they got it for $30, so they feel good about it, they got a bargain, and the triangle is there combines consumer surplus. Now here the triangle shows all the vacuum sold for $30 that cost less than $30 to produce, so that's the surplus to the producer. Notice how at equilibrium, both of these triangles are as big as they could possibly be together. If one got bigger, the other would have to necessarily get smaller. So remember, that was the same definition of equilibrium we saw in the Kelly and Joe example. Now, suppose the government decides that no one should have to pay more than $20 for a vacuum. It says that the highest price producers can charge is $20. What will happen to the units that cost producers more than $20 to make? Well, obviously they won't be produced. So here you can see the $20 price ceiling that the government has imposed. Producers will now supply only 2,000 vacuums to the market. There are still many consumers willing to pay more than $20 for a vacuum, but they're not allowed by law. There is now a large shortage of vacuums. The gray triangle is a deadweight loss. Those transactions that are not allowed to occur now because of the price ceiling. Producers would gladly make more vacuums, but they need the price to be higher in order to make money. And consumers would gladly buy them, but they're not allowed. So now there is a shortage, and also consumer and producer surplus are less than they were previously. So here are today's key terms. Be sure you recognize them and remember our examples. And remember too that we have multiple ways of defining equilibrium. Equilibrium is always the place where quantity, quantity demanded equals quantity supplied, where marginal benefit and marginal cost are equal and where consumer and producer surplus are maximized. Thank you for watching. I'll see you soon.